In this video, you'll see clips of Dr. Kevorkian's interview with my sister Marty on the night before her death. Marty speaks very softly in the video, so you may have to increase the volume settings on your VCR when she's speaking. My talk at Athens University in September of 1996 follows. with uh, Marty Ruart and her family and friends, and it's taking place at the Comfort Inn in Waterford, Michigan. Uh, in fact, it's room 211. And the time is 8... 8.29 in the evening. February 17, 1993. Uh, I'm Dr. Kevorkian. This is the patient Marty Ruart. And to my left are are her sisters and friends, and they'll introduce themselves. Mary Ruart, Karen Swindell, Teresa Coles, Bernadette Fairfax. Karen Fairfax. Have you been all your life? No. I was raised Catholic. When I was a teenager, I thought about something that was supposed to be a job. I had I wanted to go on and And nobody knows that there's a job and I know You're agnostic. Do you want any kind of religious counseling? Uh, no. None at all? No, no, no. Even if I insisted on it? Well, if you insisted, I do. But that would um, only if I insisted? Yeah, I mean, if you made me insist on procedures. Would you like that kind of coercion? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Be the freedom fighter? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know who St. Thomas More was. Uh, well, I just know you're the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you made him a saint, I think, in 1926. Uh, he was the one uh, that uh, Henry VIII, uh, he was Henry VIII, one of his uh, uh, administrators, a real close intimate friend of Henry VIII, until Henry said to him, you're Catholic, I don't like that, you got to change. And he said, I won't change. And he was beheaded. Well, Henry had him beheaded. Jesus. Well, he, he was canonized in 1926, I think, by the church, but this was a, he lived in the, in the 16th century, 16th, 17th, 16th, I think, late 16th. And he wrote Utopia. In fact, he coined the word Utopia, huh. which means no place. Huh. And in Utopia, he wrote that when it comes to a point where illness makes life not worth living, one should have the option of, of having help in ending it, or ending it himself. See? And here's a Catholic saint who endorses assisted suicide in euthanasia. And none of the Catholic authorities love to hear that. No, I thought not. I didn't know that. You didn't know that, did you? No, no. no. I think when more, more Catholics learn that, they're going to, they're going to be in doubting, too. <laughs> All right, good. I thought you'd like to hear that. Yes, thank you. Right. Uh, let's see. Anger or bitterness in the new bodies? No, I, I had a good life. That's the way I look at it. I know I was kind of surprised to find some, find out some people feel like they're being cheated on in my life. I feel like my life's been complete now. Like I got to a certain stage in my life where I was old enough to see the whole, you know, and kind of see God, and you know, see how everything worked and all that kind of stuff. Above all the pettiness of our lives. Yes. Yeah, spiritual plan. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and that's neat. So I feel like I've completed my journey. And welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. That's See the Liberty Podcast. Uh, so, Bipcot, uh, so Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. 
So today I'm uh, delighted to have a returning guest once again, Mary Ruart, who's a biomedical researcher and libertarian. And we're going to discuss assisted suicide, euthanasia, and her sister's, her little sister's experience with it um, when uh, she met Dr. Kevorkian in the early 90s, I, I assume, right? The early 90s. And um, yeah, and how that went and what it's all about and, and how is that related to libertarianism and the state? Because I'm sure, you know, when you get into the murky waters of, of, of uh, you know, medical morality, I guess you'd say, the state, of course, has to step in. And uh, drag its feet, and uh, you know, <laughs> make it make it all muddy and uh, obscure for people to understand. So, so uh, Mary, thanks a lot for coming back on the show. Well, you're welcome. It's good to be here. Yes, you uh, you mentioned this topic as a as a possible topic to discuss in the future, and I jumped on the idea because this is something that I think very few people um, have thought about, especially as it relates to the state and libertarianism. And yeah, so it's not too much um, in the literature about this, and so I'm really excited to hear your experience with it and uh, and Marty's experience. And so yeah, we're going to discuss that. <coughs> and um, and the fact, let me just give some real quick statistics. Um, right now, it's called uh, in some states the Death with Dignity Act or assisted suicide, um, and it's legal currently in the states of Oregon, Washington State, Washington D.C., Colorado, Vermont, Hawaii, and Montana. It's disputed right now, and 36 states have laws prohibiting the uh, the practice. And you, and a good uh, website you can go to is compassionandchoice.org to find out more. And so, yeah, so we're going to uh, talk about that. And her, also her cousin uh, wrote a book on Dr. Kevorkian after, um, after Marty's experience, which was uh, called Appointment with Dr. Death. And so, yeah, we're going to talk about Marty's experience and how she came to know Dr. Kevorkian and hopefully um, Mary's uh, understanding and experience of, with medical uh, mistakes, medical doctors' mistakes, because just like all of us, they're human beings, they're fallible, and uh, <laughs> so it's important to take them off the pedestal and bring that back down to earth. So, <laughs> so Mary, uh, please get into, um, yeah, wherever you want to start with all that. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Well, there's a lot to cover. Yeah. And the reason I talk about this is, you know, after Marty died, and I'll go into that in a little more detail, I... <laughs> I realized she would want me to talk about this. And so that's why I do it. And we had, in our family, we have a lot of cancer. Our mom had just died of cancer in 1991 in the spring. And by the end of 1991, Marty was telling me that she was having a lot of digestive problems. She thought she had an ulcer. And at the end of 91, we had just finished working on healing our world. And Marty had been really almost like an editor and critic for me. I would send her, I lived in Michigan, I would send her pages, typewritten pages of the book, and she would send them back. She was in California. She'd send them back with more red ink than black ink was on the page and and tell me, well, wait, the tone isn't quite right. Uh, you know, this could be misunderstood, whatever. So for your for the listeners that have read Healing Our World, you know, Marty gets a lot of credit for making it easy to read. <laughs> and and so normally what we would do is go out and celebrate with a, a restaurant meal, but we couldn't because we loved ethnic food, but it was too spicy for her. That was our first sign something was very wrong. This was at Christmas in 1991. By the end of, um, I think, January or possibly February of 92, uh, the doctors had discovered that she had a growth in her upper intestine. And they weren't sure if it was benign or if it was cancerous, but it was blocking her digestive system. And that's why she was throwing up and having problems eating. So I went to her bedside and she told me as we waited for the special surgery that would be the best one for her because they wouldn't have to take out her entire pancreas. It was sort of touching up against her pancreas, too. Um, While we were waiting for that special surgery, she said, Mary, if this is cancer, I'm not going to suffer. I'm going to go to Dr. Kevorkian. Now, at that time, Dr. Kevorkian was working in Michigan, 
And what he was doing is he was assisting patients that, you know, wanted to end their lives and end their suffering. And it was really quite, um, it was quite controversial. The uh, government had been dragging him into court, but juries hadn't convicted. So, um, you know, Marty had her surgery. It was cancer. And she went to my brother's for a while after that to recover. And then when it became obvious that the cancer had returned, she came to live with me. And she, what had happened, one of the things that had happened, because our doctors are so overworked, because the regulations are so tough that we have fewer doctors than we need. Um, one of the things that happened to Marty is she had a scan of her whole body. And the radiologist said, hey, this woman has things that we might have thought were cysts on her ovaries, but because she's just had cancer, we should check them out. I don't think her doctor really read the report very well because he told her everything was fine. And it wasn't until a few months later, because uh, it took a while for her to get a copy of the report. You know, things weren't digital then. So by the time she got a copy of the report, her ovaries on both sides were full of tumor. And so when she was living with me, she had another surgery. And the doctor told me that there were little tumors all throughout her gastrointestinal system. But Marty was a fighter, so she wasn't giving up yet. And she did all kinds of alternative therapies. She hadn't made the decision to have chemo when she had her first surgery because she thought they got it all because the radiologist had made the recommendation, but her doctor hadn't read it. So, you know, she thought she was clean and she had gotten it quickly enough. And Marty was kind of a frail person anyway. So chemo would have been difficult for her. A mom had died of chemo actually, not the cancer. And the reason she had died is because they gave her too much of a chemotherapy that hurts the heart. They told her how many doses they were going to give, and they overdosed her. And she was the one who finally came and said, you know, you guys called me in for another dose, but I've already had this many, and I was only supposed to have this many. And they went, oh, yeah, yeah we've given you too much. We're not going to give you any today. So this is the kind of medical mistakes that often get made. And the reason I'm sharing that is I think, you know, in my opinion, anyhow, as we can talk about in a little while, I think that when somebody does engage in assisted suicide, they free up really scarce medical resources that can be used to save people who really want to go till the bitter end, you know, who want to fight till the very last minute. And there are a lot of medical mistakes that are made, as you could tell just from my own little bit of experience. So I think that's an important thing to remember is that we use about 80% of our medical resources the last month or two of life. And so what ends up happening is if we leave early, those resources are available for others. But that's kind of an aside. So, so now, you know, Marty uh, had gone through these medical mistakes, realized she was in trouble. And so, you know, she was diagnosed as terminally ill, even though she was still fighting. And so hospice came in and said, we are here to help you do anything we can. And she said, oh, good. Give me Dr. Kevorkian's phone number. Hmm. And, of course, they refused to do that. Hmm. <laughs> so we called information, and he was actually listed, <laughs> believe it or not. Hmm. So we called him up, and he said, well, you know, um, I, I don't just take anyone. I, I need to see medical records and stuff, so send me your medical records. And so we did. And of course, time was, the clock was ticking and, and Marty was, you know, struggling and getting sicker. And for her, what had happened because the tumors were still in her abdomen is she was starting to throw up a lot of her meals. She couldn't hold things down like she should have because she had partial blockage of her intestines. And she was really worried that maybe Dr. Kevorkian wouldn't help her. So she had, she really didn't want to go through uh, the final stages of cancer. So we discussed different ways in which maybe I would help her if it came to that. And the whole issue with that, of course, was that it's illegal or it was illegal in Michigan 
for a physician to assist a suicide patient. Suicide itself was illegal. And of course, if I assisted, I could be prosecuted as well. And Marty didn't want that. So in our discussions, for example, she said, well, Mary, you have a gun. I could shoot myself. Hmm. I said, yeah, but of course I can't be there for that if you don't want me to be prosecuted. And what if something goes wrong, you right, know, and right. you're, you're sitting there suffering and, you know, you're not dead. Hmm. Ugh. So those were really horrible discussions that we had. It was, it was very uh, distressing. I mean, it was bad enough that Marty was sick and probably was dying. But to go through and think about all the responsibility uh, to help her end her life was, was very difficult, too. So we had a lot of discussions like that. Eventually, she just got so frustrated. She called up Dr. Kevorkian and said, you know, you got to promise to help me. Mm. <laughs> and uh, he was satisfied with the medical things. So he said, OK, OK, we'll do that. Yeah, I'll promise. I'll promise. And then right after that phone call ended, a miracle happened. <laughs> and I think this is something that, Again, most people would never think of if you haven't gone through it. But we went to bed right after that, and Marty woke up in the middle of the night, and I was sleeping next to her, and she's pulling off her pain patches, and she's saying, I'm being overdosed, I'm being overdosed. Hmm. It turned out that the fear of all that suffering was so great that it was actually compromising her health. So she actually got up and... She was hungry and she ate a meal and she kept it down. And I was really surprised because she had been even vomiting up her water at this point. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this was really amazing. And we actually called Dr. Kevorkian back and said, is this usual? And he said, yes. He says, this happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Once once a person knows I'm committed to help them, a lot of times they just die quietly on their own or they feel better for a long time. So just enjoy the time, you know. And, of course, he was never, ever uh, pressuring or anything at all. It was all about, really, you could tell he was just there to serve in whatever way he could. Hmm. You know, he's, I know in the courtroom he comes across kind of brash, but that's not the way he handles his patients. Hmm. So uh, he, was, he was a joy to work with in that, that respect. But, but eventually, of course, the cancer did catch up to her. Um, and eventually, I brought her to Dr. Kvorkian in the Detroit area, and his assistant offered his home, which was good because we had, you know, I'm, I was renting, so I couldn't offer my home. Dr. Kvorkian didn't, didn't want to do anything in a rented apartment or, in my case, a rented uh, land. I had my mobile home on it, so uh, I, I couldn't do it at my place. And, of course, there's always issues with family members. You know, my brothers, they didn't want to be there when Marty pulled the plug, so to speak, because she, they, they just didn't think they could handle it. My sisters were there and also a couple friends of the family. Hmm. Um, my father had, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, that's kind of a long story, I won't quake it into it, but he had a lady friend that really did not want to get, have him get involved with that, so he didn't. And, you know, we were we were nervous, but when we got to Dr. Kevorkian, uh, we were told that as soon as Marty died, that we'd call Jeffrey Figer, his attorney, and that the police were not prosecuting the families, which was a relief, of course. So the way this all happened was Dr. Kevorkian had a carbon, uh, carbon monoxide cylinder. Carbon monoxide is the gas that poisons people if they leave their motor running in a closed garage, mm. a car motor. So he had a tube that went from the carbon monoxide cylinder to a mask that Marty had. And before she put the mask on, of course, she said goodbye to all of us. And she put the mask on, and the tubing had a clip on it. And when she was ready, she took the clip off. And I think maybe she 
she said, you know, I think uh, something to the effect of, I think this is it. And then within, I'd say, 15 to 20 seconds, she wasn't talking anymore. And soon she was gone peacefully. So after that, we did call Jeffrey Feiger. The police did come and they took her for an autopsy. I felt very violated by that, actually. Hmm. I would have liked to spend more time just sitting with Marty's body, you know, and sitting with the rest of my family and having a quiet time. But they didn't let us do that. And when we walked out, there were, oh gosh, must have been 30 or 40. It seemed like that anyhow. Uh, 30 or 40 um, journalists out there. And we all climbed into the van. I was the last one in. Of course, they were trying to get us to talk to them, but we had made the decision not to do that. And I had a three-hour drive back home so to Kalamazoo. So by the time I got there, my answering machine was full of messages and I, I didn't realize that I walked in, the phone was ringing. I picked it up thinking it was one of my sisters. This is before, you know, you had caller ID <laughs> yeah. and, and it was a news reporter. And she said, you know, no, none of the families will ever talk to us. So we only have one side of the story to tell. And when she said that, <laughs> I could just hear Marty saying, Mary, Dr. Kevorkian's my angel. You got to defend him for me. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just could, I just could, I just knew that was, you know, I didn't hear, really hear a voice, but it was kind of an inner knowing, I guess maybe is the way to say it. Mm -hmm. And so I did talk to reporters that night and I've continued to do that if anyone has interest, because I think Marty would have wanted me to do that. Because what we had done when we wrote Healing Our World is we went through so much about how important it is to have freedom of choice and not to have government aggression. And then right after Healing Our World came out, Marty was sick and we went through, <laughs> we basically went through living um, through government aggression, <laughs> just like we had written about, you know, the medical profession making mistakes. Um, oh, and the drugs too. That was another thing. You know, Marty, Marty felt like she, if she had cannabis, you know, she would have been able to hold down, down her food. And we asked her doctor for a THC prescription, which is the active ingredient in cannabis. It's legal, but there's a lot of paperwork for the doctor. So he refused to give it to her. Hmm. So that was really, you know, that was, again, another little part of how government aggression creates suffering. Hmm. So anyhow, we had gone through this. We had lived through a sense we had written Healing Our World, then lived through some of the horrible things that we had talked about. And I really felt Marty would want me to speak up. And the nice thing about that is when I did it, it felt like we were partners again. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we're, we're writing a book, but even now, as I speak to you, I, I feel, um, you know, I feel that we're working together on this interview. <laughs> hmm. I know that sounds a little crazy, but, hmm. um, we were, we were pretty well connected. I mean, when, when I was writing healing, I had this, I had the sense of what I wanted to convey, but I wasn't able to articulate it right away. But Marty understood we were that connected. And that's why she was such a good editor. So, you know, as I talked to people about this and talked to talked on news shows, and I was on Larry King Radio, um, Rolanda, uh, Morton Downey Jr. I, so I had, I, there were a lot of things, a lot of interviews that I did. And what I realized is that people really have no understanding of, of how all this comes down. You know, in our culture, we don't like to talk about death. So people aren't prepared for it. In our family, we did talk about it more just because my maternal grandmother had died of cancer at a very early age after years of suffering. And my mother had died from it. And really almost all her relatives had died from it as well. So we, we knew about death at a very early age. And Mike Betzold, my cousin, actually lost his mother 
at a very early age. I think he was maybe 10 or 11. And he's an important player in all this because he actually was the free press reporter who should have been in that group of journalists that were outside of the house where Marty died because he was the free press reporter that had the Kevorkian beat, but he was on vacation. Hmm. Later, he wrote a book about Dr. Kevorkian, and I was on some shows with him. I, I don't think he actually ever thought it was a good idea, and and it was kind of sad because – you know, when when religious commentators would ask me, don't you worry about facing God when you die hmm. and helping somebody kill themselves? Hmm. And the way I answered them was, well, you know, if God's going to be mad at me, I'd rather have him be mad at me because I was trying to do something with compassion and love <laughs> than, you know, than let someone suffer. You know, if that's... You know, my my vision of, of, well, I should just say I probably don't have the standard vision of, <laughs> of what we would call God or consciousness. But, you know, my, my belief is you can't go wrong if you do it out of love. Because if you do it out of love and you make a mistake, you're much more likely to correct it <laughs> than if you do it because you think you know what's best for someone else and aggress against them. All right. Wow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what a, what a story. Um, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, I read there's, there's an article that you wrote that you sent me, um, that's, uh, I read a little bit about, and, and you also sent me a video about a speech. I think you gave that, what, a, a few years after, uh, 93, right? Um, yes. where you talked about it and, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, so many things, um, so many things were amazing from that story. Um, yeah, one of them was, uh, that she had, she had her accumulated wealth that she uh, gave to you, and said that she wanted you to use that to promote the message of of libertarianism. Is that is that true? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, yeah, and that's that's amazing. <laughs> you know that that was her, um, you know that was her vision for the for you for the for the future. And uh, wow, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing that we even have to talk about this. You know, it's like, <laughs> this, you know, the ultimate. Ch you know, we, we talk about government as being force and monopoly and coercion, and you know, when you when you can't choose, you know, what to do with one third of your income, you know, that's annoying, right? But when you can't choose when you want to die, like that should be the most important thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, because people suffer terribly. I, I mean, a lot of people when I was talking to reporters and stuff, they, they'd say things like, oh, well, if you titrate the pain medication the right way, there's no pain. Well, that, that's really, <laughs> that's true for some things, but not for others. And gastrointestinal pain is one of the worst. It's one of the hardest to control. So mm -hmm. I think, it, and you know, people would call me after hearing my interviews and say things like, oh, you know, I, I'm so glad you had Dr. Kevorkian because I took care of my mother. She was pleading with me to kill her. Hmm. I mean, wow. just think about think wow. how horrible that is if yeah. you're the caretaker for someone and they're in so much pain wow. and you love them and they want you to kill them. And, of wow. course, they're suffering so much they want that. But, hmm. you know, obviously that creates a bunch of problems, legal, emotional, spiritual, for the caretaker. Right. They're just so... Uh, I mean, that would have been very hard. And that's another thing. You know, a lot of people ask me, well, why do you need a doctor? Just put a bag over your head, you know. <laughs> and, and of course, there, if you read A Final Exit, uh, which is a book about how you can do yourself in with, when you're suffering, yes, you can take a bunch of drugs. You can put a plastic bag over your head and suffocate. But, you know, as a caregiver, as someone who would have had to help my sister or or set her up for a possible failure and make things worse right right that's a lot of responsibility right uh, and and I would have had to focus on that instead of my sister with Dr. Kevorkian taking care of everything I could focus on Marty in her last minutes I didn't have to take the responsibility of making sure the apparatus worked yeah making sure that I didn't make things worse mm -hmm. I mean this is really you know, this is a really horrible thing. And, and there are people I've talked to who had to make that choice, you know, to relieve their loved one's suffering. And, and what a horrible thing, you know. And people confided in me about these things. And that's what's going on in real life. And it's, it's so tragic. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it is. It is very tragic. I mean, people do have a lot of opinions about. I guess, I guess, uh, you know, when you when you strike at the core, just like with libertarianism, you know, you, you're striking at the core of their beliefs, right? This is their the beliefs of morality and life, and, uh, and yeah, people will seem to get inflammatory. But when it when it when they don't feel it personally, like like you have, you know, you tell a personal story about this, you know, how can they, how can you possibly have such a heated opinion about it, <laughs> you know, when you haven't really experienced it yourself, and or if you if you are not in that situation to have to make that decision, you know, how how different would they act then? Um, so so yeah, it's 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 kind of tragic how people jump to these. Um, um, you know, extreme conclusions about things that they have no idea, right? <laughs> Completely ignorant. Well, well, yes, and 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 again, of course, there are a lot of Christians that understand this and, and you know are, are sympathetic to assisted suicide, but there are others who think that they know God's will and God's will is to wow. uh, yeah, and that <laughs> oh God's God. will is to you know they get to, God gets to decide when you die. But if that's the case, the same logic would say, well, if you you know, if you have a disease, you're dying because of bacterial infection, then you shouldn't give antibiotics, right? Right, because, right. <laughs> right. I mean, so I have, I do have a big problem with with that kind of logic. Right. And, you know, we're always trying to relieve our suffering as human beings. It's probably the, maybe the single greatest drive that we all share other than maybe food and shelter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we don't want to suffer. And certainly it's we can, you know, and, you know, we, we would consider somebody to be very cruel if they let their pets suffer for mm, long periods of time. Right, right. If we are supposed to euthanize them. Yeah. And so, and of course the pet can't really tell you what it wants, but mm-hmm. people can. And, and that's another thing. Uh, there is a difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia. Euthanasia, someone else is making the decision. <laughs> and mm. a suicide, you're making the decision. And that's really the way it should be. Unfortunately, there are cases where somebody gets sick, they're unconscious, and if the family doesn't know what their wishes are, they don't know how to make that decision. I see. And, right. and many times doctors have to make such decisions. You know, that's that's just the way it is. So to to say that well, we, you know, we really shouldn't do that uh, because it's a slippery slope. It's not a slippery slope at all. You know, as long as we let the patient make the decision, when we don't know what the patient wants, of course, then it's very difficult. But yeah. the family generally has some idea. So, you know, that's really, in my opinion, a better a better way to go than having people suffer. You know, there's just a lot that goes on when somebody's dying. Have you heard about this recent uh, Alfie Evans case with the little baby in the yes. UK? This, yes. This, yes. This, this reminds me a lot of that, but because the baby, you know, the infant cannot speak for itself, right? So then it it, it falls onto the parents. However, in that case, it was the state that made the decision, yes. right, to pull the plug. Well, this, mm-hmm. well, and the state wants to make the decision. I mean, that was why they kept dragging Dr. Kevorkian into court. Mm. And they finally did get a conviction. He was in, I think, for eight years before they let him go. He was supposed to get 10 to 25, but he was ill. Mm. And I think they just didn't want to give him the medical care he needed, Mm. which that's, you know, okay. So, I mean, I'm glad they let him out. That was good. He had to promise not to do any more assisted suicides. Uh, But I think that was a good move on his part. He had done his, you know. You know, your point about... um you know when when people elect to to die uh and then that frees up resources for to help other people who perhaps want to continue fighting till the end uh, mm-hmm. you know that's a very it's a very um you know calculated and economic um risk assessment or or i guess analysis and but but it it, it has a kernel of truth because <laughs> you know it's true you know that you know someone yeah. who who wants to die but is prevented from dying is actually using up scarce resources that perhaps yes. could have gone to help someone else who perhaps maybe perhaps maybe has a preventable illness <laughs> well well it's it's like this you know 80 percent of the resources we use in the last few months of our lives so Marty probably went, uh, I'm going to guess, who knows for sure, three or four months early. So she freed up those resources. And it's important because remember, I was telling you earlier that my mother died of the chemotherapy, not the cancer, because right, right. they were too busy to count right. Yeah. And then Marty's radiologist 
correctly said you ought to look at these little cyst-like things on her ovaries, but the doctor, her, her physician, must not have read it. You know, and, and, you know, these doctors are overworked because of the regulations that restrict the number of doctors. This yep, is a, yep. another libertarian issue we could yep. talk about. And so this is not a trivial matter. There are many, many medical mistakes that result in death. And most people aren't aware of it because unless you're in the medical profession, you know, as I am to some extent, you don't see these mistakes. Mm -hmm. You don't know that they're happening. You know, if Marty hadn't ordered her radiology report, we wouldn't have known about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, luckily my mother was counting <laughs> and, you know, let the people know, hey, you're giving me too much stuff. <laughs> yeah. But this should never be happening. These are easily preventable if our doctors weren't so overworked. So I am, I am totally convinced that because Marty went early, her doctors had a little more time to spend with other patients. And because of that, I'm hoping that they didn't miss things like this. I'm hoping that right. because their, their, their day was a little more relaxed one day, they actually read the radiology report or correctly counted how much chemo that their patients got and, you know, helped save a life. Yeah, all the all the regulations uh, that hamper uh, new people coming into the medical field, and all also the the astronomical cost of actually getting <laughs> a medical degree and going to the university. Um, I, I think the phenomenon is called a bottleneck, right? It creates a bottleneck where so few people can get through all that, all those hurdles, and so the result is that people are overworked. What eighty? What are they? What are like medical doctors and surgeons like eighty to ninety hours? per week you know bar barely sleeping barely seeing their families you know mm -hmm. and surviving on coffee maybe sleeping at the hospital sometimes like yeah. Yeah, it happens. In fact, California, I think, passed a law saying hospital physicians couldn't work more than 80 hours a week. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what they need, another law. That's, that's, that's exactly what they, exactly they, they need. You know, but the fact that they did that shows yeah. they recognized there was this huge problem yeah. of doctor overwork. And it's especially true for interns and residents. I mean, they just, they really... Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, you know, I, I was working with a transplant surgeon once and we were a liver transplant surgeon because liver was one of my fields and we were we were working on an animal and, you know, he said, you're really a good surgeon, you know, why, why didn't you get your MD and you could have become a transplant surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, sort of half joking, I said, you know, I, I can't, I couldn't operate for, with, for 24 hours without sleep. <laughs> he said, "Yeah, really, I have to be able to do that." Wow! Yeah. <laughs> so this, you know, this is the level of which we stress out our doctors, and so we shouldn't be surprised that there are all these mistakes. A lot of people have asked me, "Why didn't you sue Marty's doctors?" Well, wouldn't bring her back. Wouldn't have brought my mom back. And right. you know, they've got they've right. got enough problems. You know, uh, I mean, I if you stress people that much, they're going to make mistakes. So. Yeah, you know, you think of how many mistakes, you know, let's say, I don't know, plumbers make or mechanics make and they don't work 80 to 90 hours a week and their job is not really, I guess you could you could kind of, uh, um, you know, put it on a priority scale, <laughs> them and surgeons, mechanics, not so not so vital to, to human existence, you know, whereas a surgeon that re that you know, needs steady, precise hands. <laughs> and like you said, barely getting any sleep, poor nutrition, you know, dosed up on coffee. Yeah. Oh, what kind yeah. of a recipe is that? Well, yeah. And, and they have to, if they want to service the patients because there's so many of them, you know, yeah. it's, it's really, uh, so I, I, I can hardly blame them for that. And, and again, that's just one of the things Marty and I worked on when we wrote healing our world was the regulatory, restrictions on on doctors and how dangerous that was yeah and and uh, you know the end result to all that uh you know the extreme end result would be like complete socialized medicine which is basically what my wife experienced in uh, communist romania when she was growing up and she, she would tell me stories about uh going to the dentist long lines and then you hear people screaming yeah. in the chair <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the person leaves the chair next <laughs> you know? like that's yeah. That's the experience. Like when you when the go when the state takes over, you know any field, especially in medicine, like you know, quality just plummets. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. In fact, you know, 
if you look at the different restrictions on electricians from state to state, the states that have the most rigid laws uh, about electrician licensing are also the ones that have the most accidental electrocution. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason is that if you have more requirements, it costs more in time and money to get your license. So there are fewer electricians, so they can charge more. So then what happens if a poor person has an electrical problem, they say, I can't afford this. I'll mm. have to fix it myself. Right, right. Maybe they don't fix it at all, and there's a fire or something. So yeah, yeah. This, this is what happens. It's happened in our medical profession, too. And it was really the American Medical Association actually talked about how they were going to do this in the 1930s, right straight in the medical journal, saying we have to have professional birth control. So we're going to limit the number of doctors. And they did. Professional birth control. <laughs> That's right. And you see, because um, the American Medical Association, of course, really kind of controls the medical licensing boards, yeah. which every state has. So, right. you know, they can say what kind of school right, right. you have to go to. Uh, they can say apprenticeship no longer uh, is going to be um, considered adequate education mm -hmm. and on all these restrictions so that fewer people can go to medical school. And of course, if you do manage to go to medical school, uh, you are saddled with a debt that's very, very large. Yeah, I remember uh, learning about some of the history of the American Medical Association. And uh, before it was formed, um, you know, allopathic physicians basically um, were working side by side as uh, uh, with ho homeopaths. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at that time, um, even at that time, the uh, uh, allopathic physicians were considered to be the more invasive and the more dangerous of the medicine, and the homeopaths were, you know, more gentle, more non-invasive. And and so the, the in in order to defeat their competition, they formed this um, this association and then allied themselves with the state to mm -hmm. enact all these restrictions on the medical field, and basically form their own little. Um, would that be a cartel or a monopoly or something? <laughs> you know, yeah, just just yeah. crowd out everyone else from the market, from the medical market, who can't afford to comply with all these, uh, you know, uh, regulations. No, well, that's right, and and actually, they almost drove the chiropractors out of business. But the chiropractors sued under the antitrust laws of all things, and they uh. won. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there was ever a good use of antitrust laws, it was probably it. <laughs> <laughs> but so so they. They pervade, and I'm so glad because I've needed chiropractic services for most of my adult life, and I cannot imagine the suffering I would have had without them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing how, you know, when there exists an entity that has the ability, you know, or the legalized ability to do coercion, you know, all these um, businesses and um, professions seek its protection, Right. And it's, uh, you know, it's cover <laughs> and also to just just keep out the small competitors, you know, make, make the barriers way high. And and it's a wonderful way rather than rather than spending your resources towards improving your product or your service and improving yeah. your skill set. You're spending your resources <laughs> appealing to the state <laughs> to prevent other people <laughs> from competing. That's right. And you have to laugh because otherwise you would cry because it's so tragic because it creates so much suffering. It's, it's really amazing. And, of course, the underlying belief is that we don't own our own lives. I mean, that's really what it amounts to. Right. If you can't take your life when you become so miserable, you do not want to, right. you know, live through it. You know, if, if you're forced to suffer, for what end? Yeah. You know, there's no, no wonderful thing that happens when you suffer. Let, let me so, ask you a question. So what, what, what do you think uh... – what's the benefit that the state has by making suicide illegal? <laughs> why, why is it, why is that the case? What do you think? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I mean, it's, it's hard to think of a logical reason. Why <laughs> right. Right. Is. Equating logic with the state. I, I know you're never going to find. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Good point. I, I have to say, you know, so I think it's, it's just, you know, I think on the, if you take it in the broad sense, I think it's a way of saying we own you. Ah, That's really I see. what it is. I see, I see. And the, but the other sense of it is, you know, I think a lot of, especially the assisted suicide issue is driven by religious beliefs. And mm. I guess what I'd like to share with your listeners, if, if they're one of the people that 
believe that, you know, we need to enforce God's law as, mm. as they see it. Mm. Uh, you know, once you start mixing uh, church and state, mm -hmm. you have big problems. Yeah. And that's really <laughs> what assisted suicide laws generally are. Mm. They're um, people who feel they know the will of God imposing what they think is the will on other people. But if you turn to the government and ask them to enact what you think is God's will one day, tomorrow, somebody else is going to come with an entirely different interpretation of God's will and, and in, enact a law against you. Uh, the religious freedom would, in my mind, should be excluding any, any, um, any law that doesn't let you take your own life. And I think the people, the religious people who think they're doing God's will don't recognize what they're actually doing is setting themselves up for persecution in later years by giving the state basically the power to enforce religious beliefs. Hmm. Wow. So, so, so church and state is not yet separated even to this modern day. Wow. No, I, that, that's... I mean, that that's, That's the impression I got when I did all these interviews and got right. the kind of questions I got. So, right, right. like I said, my, my belief is that, um, well, first of all, I mean, if I were to interpret, <laughs> if I were to try to, and I, I wouldn't do this, but if I were to lay out what I thought was God's will, I would <laughs> on the air on the side of love. I mean, that's, that's one thing that I you know, that I personally find useful is the idea of loving your neighbor. And I don't think it's very loving to let your neighbor suffer when they're ready to go, and that should be their choice. I, I mean, going along with that, with that logic, with that uh, train of thought, you know, if if I were to, you know, try to imagine what God's will is, basically, it's respect the will of others. You know, respect what yes. other people want to do with their lives. That's right. <laughs> How do you know what's best for your neighbor? We don't know. No, we don't. We don't. We don't. How do we know God's will? Again, it's a matter of opinion. Exactly. You, you know, so, <laughs> so it gets it, but this is my impression from all the interviews I've done that it's basically mostly a religious matter. Hmm. And and that's why so many people, you know, get it on this issue because even even a lot of people who are very religious, they get it, you know. It's like, hey, I'm not going to impose my will on you. That would be judgment. That would be against, you know, everything I know about spirituality. So so they get it, um, and some don't. So, you know, I don't I, I want to make sure I say that because I don't want to give the impression that I'm beating up on religious people. I'm simply beating up on religious people who, <laughs> if you say beating up. <laughs> Verbally beating up. Verbally. I'm, I'm warning them. Let's put it that way. I'm trying to warn them that that what they do unto others today will be done unto them. Right. Tomorrow. right. I mean, that is, you know, so the essence of religious freedom is not to impose our religious opinions or spiritual beliefs on others. If we do it, we're setting ourselves up for danger tomorrow. Right. Right. You know, just live and let live. I mean, I, I mean, um, yeah, it's amazing when people say that, you know, we, what do you know the will of, how do you know the will of God? Do you say, say you can say the same thing as them. Well, how do you know the will of God? <laughs> oh, definitely. You know? So I think we have to be very, you know, very gentle about that because, you know, it's basically our ego talking. <laughs> right. I mean, oh, man. I, I, I mean, even even if they say what's well, on the Bible, well, you got to interpret it still and and human beings wrote it down so still you know just like just like that uh you know that game the child's game uh what's it called um when you talk to somebody say something and then the message changes oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> telephone telephone mean. telephone yeah. <laughs> same yeah. thing you know people write down the will of god all right it's changed already and then people who interpret that it's changed again so <laughs> yeah that's right that's right well and and of course you know, I know many of the people who are listening as libertarians may may not believe in God at all. And they find, of course, it, I'm sure they find it very difficult to have religious beliefs imposed on them. And, yeah. and no wonder. Nobody wants that. You know, sure. it doesn't matter who you are, how deep your beliefs uh, are in, in spirituality and religion. People imposing their beliefs on you. And yet that's what we're setting ourselves up for. So that's. And I, I, I've spent a lot of time on this topic just because my impression is that the actual motivations behind banning assisted suicide is mostly 
mostly religious in intent. I think that's where most of it comes from. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's just, uh, yeah, it's just very tragic that, uh, that pe- even now, even now we're still having this conversation and, uh, religion is still budding into our lives, um, without, um, <laughs> you know, w- without invitation. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, I don't, ha- I don't have anything against religious people either. And, you know, when I first started on, uh, liberty on, you know, volunteerism and anarchism, I, uh, I thought that, you know, how could you be, let's say a Christian and be an anarchist? It doesn't make sense. You know, we're against <laughs> rulers, but you have God as your ruler. So I don't get that. But then I started talking to Christian anarchists and I had invited them a lot of my show, interviewed a couple of them. And it's cool. You know, yes, you yep. can be like that. No problem. And and the ultimate the ultimate conclusion is if you're not willing to forcefully impose that via the state onto other people, that's cool. <laughs> Believe what you want. You know, well, yeah. And, and in Healing Our World, of course, uh, I had these sidebars, and the Bible was the most quoted sidebar of all, because uh. frankly, after 11 years of Catholic education, where <laughs> I went to Mass every day, had an hour of religious instruction, etc., wow. what I walked away with was, okay, um, basically, to be a true Christian, you have to live and let live. Right. <laughs> Right. No judgment, you know, you, you don't impose your will on others. You love your neighbor as yourself, right? You yeah. don't would put a gun to your own head to do something. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So you don't force others to your will, you know, and, and that's really throughout so, so much of the Bible is about that. So it's, in fact, I think the Ten Commandments are one of the earliest libertarian <laughs> manifestos, the parts where they talk about how you interact with your neighbor. Mm-hmm. You don't steal from them. You don't murder. <laughs> you don't bear false witness. Mm-hmm. You don't covet what's theirs. Exactly. <laughs> their wife, you don't cover their, co- covet their property. So exactly. I, I think, and I bring that up because, again, I, I'm, my my sense of things is that even if you're a very religious person, you know, you you can be very comfortable with the libertarian philosophy. In fact, it's hard to, if you're truly a Christian, I think it's hard not to be a libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder if uh, if Karl Marx has studied a little bit more of the Bible, the, the the morality and how you should deal with your neighbor part, then uh, perhaps history might have turned out differently. <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you perhaps you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have wrote his uh, Das Kapital book, and uh, yeah, millions of people would not have died. Wouldn't that have been a wonderful thing? So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and this gets to a a little bit other subject, too. I know there's a lot of libertarians who come from a more atheistic standpoint and and look down on Christian libertarians. And, you know, I think that's that's a mistake, because I think there is there is a great truth in um, in Christianity. It's just not it's not in doctrine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's in. It's in the way Christ lived. You know, he he wouldn't he didn't force other people to give their money to charity. Right. He might have asked, <laughs> but he never forced them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's the power. If you you know, yeah, if yeah. you believe he was divine, then you know he certainly had that power. He could have forced people. Yeah, yeah. There's so many memes. You know, what would Jesus do? Or, or you know, him. You see him. Uh, you, see, yeah. you see. You see him caring for somebody who's like injured. And it says, uh, quick, this man is ill. Go pass a law to force other people to pay for his health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't going to happen. You know? or, no, or, no. or he's like, or he's like, I said give to the poor, not force other people to give their money to the poor. No. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, <laughs> you know, you didn't, the only time you saw something uh, even approaching force going on are the money changers in the temple who were defrauding <laughs> basically the people. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not um, Christian. I didn't grow up with any particular religion. I was interested in world religions, um, but I wouldn't call myself an atheist. You know, I consider myself more of a spiritual person. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I met, I, I, you know, I, I see that. Yeah. Atheism does, does t- tend to run in libertarianism a lot. Um, but you know, um, I, I've met a lot of wonderful Christian volunteers and, and, you know, you, you know, what's just wonderful with Facebook. I'm, I'm finding like volunteers groups all around the world, like Cuba, like, um, um, India, Pakistan, Russia, like, and, and it's wonderful to see that. And, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to connect with them to show that this is not just a phenomenon that's 
um, that's in the United States. You know, this is worldwide that it's taking root. You know, people are starting to break down these these borders. You know, these these state mm-hmm. fictions, and and starting to understand these fundamental concepts that you know the real oppressor is not <laughs> it's not the rich man. You know, it's not the yeah. white man. It's not <laughs> men. You know, <laughs> it's, right. it's just pe- right. people who feel like. They are in control and they have the power to tell you what to do and what to spend your money on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, you know, I've been really excited because, of course, I started at, in the late 60s. I really became a libertarian and in the early 80s. I was running as a candidate. And throughout the years, it's been, you know, we just haven't had a lot of youth in the party. Mm. And that's so changed, not just the party, the whole movement. Mm. And it's worldwide. It's not just, you know, it's, it's, and it's a wonderful feeling for me because of course I'm, I'm getting on in years. I'm getting to the point where, uh, one day in the not too distant future, I'll be passing the baton. And it's wonderful to see people like yourself Mm -hmm. and the young people all over the world really getting it. it. It's, it's, it's wonderful because it's, it's like the seed took a long time to germinate, but now I see it's germinating and it's wonderful. So I'm, I'm so excited because I, I, I can sense it rolling out. You know, I, I can sense things really changing and it's, it's just a wonderful thing. So, so have you, uh, like, did you meet um, Tom Woods or, or Rothbard uh, in the early days? Yes. I, well, I met Rothbard, at, I think, in the 83 National Convention. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, I met Tom Woods, but it was somewhat later. Okay, 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 right, right. Yeah, so he's a wonderful guy too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Tom Woods is awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember one quote uh, that that Murray Rothbard said, which was like, uh, you know, the, you know, I don't know. There was a bunch of them in a room. He's like, this is this is the libertarians in the United States <laughs> in this room, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and and one thing, yeah. Let's let's talk about this a little more. Um, one thing I noticed about um, some of the early libertarians who who did a lot of great things in helping the movement get started, they had something that um, they had something going from from Ayn Rand. Now, Ayn Rand brought me into the movement, so I have a lot of respect for her. Mm-hmm. I think she was though. She did say, "Judge and be prepared to be judged." And I think this really hurt our early movement because hmm. that's what a, lo- a lot of people did. They just kept judging each other, and it created a lot of animosity. Instead of work- working together and focusing on what we all believed in, hmm. we were nitpicking each other, and that's very destructive. And I bring this up at this point in time because we were talking about Christianity and, and libertarians a little earlier, and this is something that Christian libertarians bring to the movement <laughs> Hmm. That is very vital, hmm. and that is they really get the the, the business about not judging, you hmm. know, because what happens is if you judge others, well, you'll, you know, that'll be reflected back to you. And in fact, if you judge others, you tend to judge yourself too, and that's not real healthy. Hmm. <laughs> so that's something that the libertarian Christians really bring to the mix. I think they they really bring that sense of non judgment and love. And loving a, loving your neighbor, you know, sometimes we get so focused on, as libertarians, we get so focused on the force that the government brings to bear on us to do good things like supporting the poor and things like that, that we forget our enemy is not the poor. <laughs> it's, it's, that's not, that's not where we should be pointing the finger. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, but it's easy to do that. I've seen a lot of people do that. They don't want to give to charity because they feel they're giving at the office, so to speak, through their paycheck and tax deductions. And we can certainly understand that. But sometimes then they don't have sympathy for those or compassion for those that probably would be good to have sympathy and compassion for. And we get criticized a lot for being harsh and and for not, um, not having that compassion. And that's why when I... This last edition of Healing Our World was Healing Our World, the Compassion of Libertarianism, because the wonderful thing is it doesn't matter, actually, if you're compassionate or not. The reforms that we're suggesting are going to help enrich the poor and save the environment, (laughs) to tear crime and diffuse terrorism, all these wonderful things that you would think a compassionate world would do, but it happens without 
you know, any one of us needing to be compassionate. All we need to do is follow the non-aggression principle, and compassion happens automatically. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really love too. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of that um, that argument that some people will present, which is, uh, well, in your in your anarchist world, you assume everyone's going to be an angel and it's going to treat everybody well and everyone's going to just go along with your non-aggression principle. And what if they don't? <laughs> you know, and, and I'm like, well, actually, um, I think in the current in the current system that we have where there is legalized aggression and institutionalized power um uh <laughs> that actually attracts you know the scum <laughs> the exactly. low the base exactly. the, the wicked <laughs> and so right. if you if you want a system that's going to attract the worst of mankind that's the current system we have <laughs> that's maybe, right maybe that's we right. should try something better <laughs> <laughs> yes yes and and of course that gets back to the fact that we all we all act in our best self-interest, assuming we know what that is, of course. And we'll make a mistake or two. But in general, people do know what their best self-interest is. Unless, of course, they have uh, had propaganda uh, thrown at them that tells them otherwise. And I think that's another big problem we have in our society. We are, we are taught just the opposite of the way reality is. So that's that's an issue that we're always fighting as libertarians because there are a lot of misconceptions about what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I really do appreciate um how you do focus on compassion and love, uh and loving your neighbor because that's that's essentially what it's about. You know, it's I mean people as uh as uh, anarchists and volunteers we can focus on the uh, economics of it and that's good too and in business and you know, private versus public and all that. But it's you know it's just about love and 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 about you know respecting the decisions of other people and you know you want something you have to trade for it give something in return right yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. it that's it yeah. um, so it does it, to me it also I think comes down to love and uh, and I think not enough people focus on that aspect and I think it's a wonderful wonderful uh, perspective to present so mm -hmm. um, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, if you don't have love, it's easy to, it's easy to justify aggression. You know, it, it's yeah. interesting. I use the, I use the analogy of, you know, you're going down the street and you see a wallet. <laughs> hmm. Now, if you're a loving person, you pick up that wallet, you see there's money in it, credit cards and a driver's license. You go, oh my gosh, somebody is really freaking out right now. Right, <laughs> I right. call right away right. until I've got their wallet and it's safe. Right. right. But if you're, if you don't have that, love if you have that sense of compassion or connection with humans you don't think about how they're going to feel you look at that and go oh okay well somebody dropped their wallet that was pretty careless of them mm. you know what i'll do i'll i'll cut up the credit cards and i'll take the cash and you know i mean i'm really doing them a favor because if somebody else had picked this up they'd have been using the credit cards mm. it's so easy yeah, <laughs> to yeah. justify something like that and you might say well that's a little thing but you know that's the road we go down um if we and I think, you know, that's so if we want to keep our if we want to keep our libertarian society, once we get it, I think we do have to have that love component, compassion component, mm -hmm. connection with kind, whatever you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know that um, and I tell the story in healing and maybe you know it. Um, but, you know, I actually had an opportunity to talk with a gentleman who was one of the people who created the propaganda to sell people on doing things that were against their best self-interest. Hmm. You know, in other words, passing regulations and taxes and things like this. Hmm. And um, I could see he wasn't happy, so I asked him what his goals in life were. And he said, power and money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I first I thought he was kidding, because, you know, who says that? Right, 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 right. right. But, but um, you know, he was serious. And I said, but you already have power and money. And <laughs> what do you think would make you happy? <laughs> And it took me years to understand his answer. It really was enlightening. I wish I had gotten it right away. He said, well, you know, I think to be happy, I think I need to feel connected to humankind, and I don't. Mm. And, you know, how could he feel connected? He's always deceiving someone. So, you know, if you're using aggression against someone, you have to separate yourself from them emotionally. You have to say, well, that person's so stupid. I'll tell him this, and he'll believe it. Right. Or this person, um, 
He's selfish. He deserves to be forced to pay taxes. You know, in other words, there's always this judgment going on, this separation, this emotional separation with the other person. And this gentleman, he was like giving propaganda for the whole country, right? Hmm. So he was separating himself from everyone. Hmm. In fact, he, from what he told me, he even lied to his family for their own good. You know? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, hmm. so so he, all it basically his whole life was lying to people, right? So first of all, he separated himself from everyone, and then wondered why he wasn't happy. He had the he had the brains to say, "I need to feel connected," and I don't, and that's why he didn't feel connected. And it, like I said, it took me many years to really get that. So so in other words, my bottom line here is that if we practice aggression in order to get power and money mm. or to get something that we think is going to make us happy, it backfires. I mean, we're, we're doing this aggression to become happy, but as soon as we use aggression, we fix it so we can't be happy. <laughs> and it's just creating the separation. Right? Right, right. So, so it's, uh, you know, I, when I really understood that, I said, okay, so ultimately then when we use aggression, not only do we hurt others, we, we really hurt ourselves in a lot of ways. And once we realize that, who's going to want to aggress? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there is a movement uh, to understand that. You know, there's a whole, you know, some people call it the human potential movement. Some people call it a spiritual movement. There's a, there's a more and more an understanding that aggression doesn't serve us. And so I, I love talking and spending time with people who get that because, I think when the libertarian movement blends with the movements that are uh, getting this very important principle, whether they be Christian libertarians or spiritual libertarians or simply psychological libertarians that understand that you can't create separation and expect to be happy, mm. uh, I think things will really move quickly <laughs> mm. and we'll have a libertarian world. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, uh, now that I think about it, libertarianism is what is encouraging people to bring out their humanity in, yes. in each other yes. and in themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, your story about the wallet, I don't, I don't know if that happened to you in your personal life, but for me, it happened once where I was at a um, like a big department store, like a, like a shop, right or something, a stop and shop. And um, and, you know, you can do cash back. Right. So I. I, I, I wanted to do two hundred dollars cash back, and it was a an automated um, machine. It wasn't a person checking. Uh, I was checking other groceries. It was an automated machine, and so I said I wanted to do two hundred dollars cash back, and so it gave me two hundred dollars in twenty dollar bills. And I left the stop and shop, and I forgot to take my two hundred dollars. And I I went to another store, which is like I don't know a quarter mile down the road, and and then I remember when I was there, <gasps> and I ran back really fast. I ran back really fast, and I was so lucky that it was this little elderly lady who was just, I, I was just watching her. She was going through that uh, same teller and she had picked it up and I said, oh, oh, oh thank you. That, that's fine. <laughs> she was like, oh, I was wondering who this was. <laughs> and she's like, I was going to give it to the, uh, I don't know, to the front desk, I think she said. But I'm like, oh, thank you so much. And, and, it, and yeah, it really, you know, impressed me that, uh, that somebody would do that, and um, and yeah, it's very inspiring, you know, when that happens to you. I don't, have you had an experience like that? Um, well, I, I've had, uh, yeah, actually, I have. Mm -hmm. I keep leaving my purse everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, don't, I haven't done it for a long time, but there was like a year where it seemed like I had to really watch myself because uh. I'd hang it, put my purse on the back of the chair, like when I had a meal somewhere uh, or something and yeah. they'd walk out without it Ooh. i always got my purse back uh, no, no, you know nobody had touched it or or they had it like you say at the front desk or wherever you know yeah. it, it's always intact yeah i was I, you know i felt i it, when things like that happen especially when they're repeated so many times <laughs> <laughs> you see that you're putting out all this love and, and you're getting it back <laughs> <laughs> you know you also kind of remind me of my mother because ever since i've been uh, uh ever since i was little i remember every time we would go somewhere she would always leave her car unlocked and my father would hate it he's like lock your lock your car and she's like no i believe in the goodness of people and i i think that i have good karma and nobody's gonna want to break into my car <laughs> uh, let me ask you are you are you, that, are you like that with your car 
No, actually, you know, I grew up in Detroit, so I actually am on the other side. Ah. I, mean, I, do, I do lock things, but you know, many times, many times I have forgotten or something and, you know, nothing ever, I don't expect anything to happen, yeah. but what has happened is people I've lived with or whatever have like retrained me, you know, to, <laughs> to, to make sure that I lock because, you know, I, I do live alone, so, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and, and so I guess it's probably, let me just put it this, I, I'm not fanatical about it, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's kind of the thing of, I don't expect bad things to happen, right. but I, I, I also don't deliberately leave my purse on the chair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> I don't deliberately leave the door unlocked. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I, go, go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, I take the usual precautions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, 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 I agree. Yeah, I remember watching a documentary um, and they were comparing people living in the United States to people living in, in Canada. But, I mean, I guess you can't really make the comparison because, you know, it could be in the, in the city. People act differently in the city than in the suburbs and in the, you know, really remote areas. <clears throat> but um, but in the documentary, they were saying how in, in, in the United States, everyone locks their door, their, their car door, their house door. Everything is locked, right? Whereas in Canada, you know, nothing is locked. <laughs> and, and, he, and he made this, like, experiment. He was just, like, walking down a residential neighborhood in Canada, and he just walks into somebody's house. Oh, hi. <laughs> he just walks into their house. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a cultural thing. I don't know. but yeah. Well, actually, I've lived in places where the realtors, they're showing us houses and said, well, nobody has keys around here because they've <laughs> Them. You know, so oh, wow. there are places in the U.S. that are still like that, and yeah. it's it's uh, and you know out west, of course, it's much more common. Yeah, so, yeah, that would yeah, make sense. So that makes sense. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, there's just a cultural thing. I, I mean, I keep. I, if I lived in New York City, I would definitely make sure I kept my doors locked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not that you're a bad person for locking your things. It's just that you know you want to. Make sure, you know, things are safe, you know, security and uh, all that stuff, you know. We believe yeah. in the goodness of people, but still, you know, you, you advocate, you know, self-defense. If you're being aggressed upon, you know, it's completely legitimate. So <laughs> no harm in that. Yes, I mean, I actually, I don't worry about it, you know. I just, it's just, you know, I just, like I said, I, I do the things that one does to to make sure that uh, you're as safe as possible. Sure. And, you know, realizing that, no lock will keep a determined person out. <laughs> exactly. That's true. And, uh, yeah. you know, that I try to live in places where if I don't lock the door, I forget it's, it's okay too. You know, right, right, right. I'm not in New York city. <laughs> well, well, I, I hope that you will always be surrounded by people who will give you back your purse after you leave, um, a restaurant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's my hope. I hope so too. <laughs> so, uh, what do I, I have you know, wonderful conversation, um, Mary. I really appreciate you coming on to share this story because uh, this is not something that uh, is talked about much in the libertarian world. And uh, it's wonderful to hear, um, you know, a libertarian's perspective on this because, yeah, this is great. It's just going to add to the wealth of information that people can access about, you know, all the different ways that the state uh, corrupts our lives and just yes. makes it more difficult and more onerous and so yeah so i just want to thank you for sharing um so if anybody wants to follow mary please oh actually you know what uh, just just um, reiterate your contact information uh if people want to follow you sure well the best thing to do is go to my website ruart.com r-u-w-a-r-t.com and you can click on the facebook or twitter or YouTube icon and, and uh, of course sign up for my newsletter and you'll hear what's going on in my world. Yes, yes, please do. Uh, she's got a lot of wonderful things to share and uh, you know check out her book, her recent book, um, Death by Regulation. Um, help her with the sales of that. You know that would do her a great service and also her other book, um, uh, Healing Our World: The Compassion of Libertarianism. Wonderful message. Uh, you you can't go wrong with it. So, yes. <laughs> and, and you're helping. Lot, the free library has a lot of free stuff, including the 93 edition of Healing Our World. So you can enjoy a lot of things without buying anything. <laughs> Sometimes I know as libertarians we tend to be kind of broke as we <laughs> run our campaigns on our own dime, but uh, there's a lot there to uh, to enjoy. You see that she's b busting another myth again of, of you know libertarians or, or volunteers being these greedy capitalists and uh, and she is definitely not so yeah <laughs> wonderful to hear. 
<laughs> so wonderful conversation. Um, thank you very much for listening. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and voluntarism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.